The Tracker by Tom Brown Jr. Chapter 1, Part 3 <clears throat> It was years before I realized how far his perceptions extended, how much he saw in a glance, how much he heard, how incredibly much he knew. But it was clear from the instant I first met him that he knew more of what was worth knowing than anyone I would ever meet. Rick idolized him, and the longer I knew Stalking Wolf, the more I understood why. Stalking Wolf was very old, and he drifted into the reverses that made him seem as if he might be senile when I first met him. But as I realized later, when I had seen with amazement how keen his senses were, that he had simply gone inside of himself for a moment to check his perceptions against the pattern of the world. Only after he had taught me how to be silent that I realized that he was stopping his own motion so he could tell the disturbances around him from his own. It is a silence out of which the tracker listens for the scolding of birds deeper in the woods, or the sound that crackles the branches against the rustle of the wind. Only by silence and rapt attention can anyone hope to feel the ripples in the flow of life in the woods which spread outward from an intrusion or disturbance. The scolding with Jay will put every bird with an earshot on edge. Birds are the outlooks of the woods. They spread local alarms. You can hear their cries going back and forth through the air like emergency calls. A man going through the wood turns up as much noise as he turns up landscape. All you have to do is hear it to be quiet and listen. Stalking wolf silences were the mark of his skill, the habit of a long-practiced art. He was the grandson of a medicine man and a tracker and hunter for his tribe. To Rick and me, he was the spirit of the woods. I believe that he trained us the way he himself had been trained as a child in the last years of the 19th century. He taught us a way of life in which Rick and I tried to live by. He was like an uncle who helps with the training of his brother's sons, aloft but affectionate, judgmental but secretly amused, <laughs> gentle and harsh, guiding without directing. What he taught us permeated everything we did. He taught us to look for subtleties, for nuances, and we had to be quick to catch his hints. I asked him once why he, had, he was so still at times, and he said, to see better. I may have looked puzzled, but I didn't say anything because neither Rick nor I wanted Stalking Wolf to think we were stupid. Besides, we knew we would never give us he would never give us the answer to anything directly. Usually, we <clears throat> we said we understood and then went away and figured it out between ourselves. <laughs> then we went back to Stalking Wolf and told him that we had done what we had done and what had been the results. Stalking Wolf would either give us his approval of what we had done. Or he would tell us we hadn't looked or hadn't been as quiet as we thought we had. Then he would give us a hint about what we should do to about what we should do to do whatever we did better until we finally figured out a way that was workable for us. Without his guidance, we might have learned part of what we did learn, but it would have taken us ten times as long. <clears throat> and some of some of it we would never have gotten at all. He gave us information that would lead us on to the next step, a bit at a time, and always waited until he had, until we had incorporated what we had learned before he nudged us towards something else. Stalking Wolf led us out of childhood into a unique kind of manhood. We came to our skills as we had come to his, through a series of ideas and understandings that could only could only be gotten out of experience. He taught us to make use of everything, to live with the least disruption to, of the earth, to reverse what we had take from, taken from the woods, to master our fear, to hone our special skills sharper and sharper, to extend our senses and our awareness, to live in the space of the moment, and to understand eternity. I learned from Stalking Wolf a skill that would encompass everything I met. I learned to track, and not animals or men, but disturbances, things knocked out of place, minute and distinct traces, the ghost of a print, the stone turned the wrong side up, a fragment of hair on a branch. Stalking Wolf taught us how to be silent and watch what was going on. 
He had a special look that said he was giving us a hint to something that would seem obvious to us in a moment. When we saw that I didn't un when he saw that I didn't understand why he had to be silent to be see better, he said, "Go feed the birds." Rick and I immediately got some seed and went out to see feed the birds. Stalking Wolf came out and watched us and giggled in his hand. He looked away whenever we looked at him for approval. We tossed the seed. We laid it down. We put it in piles. Nothing pleased him. Finally, he shook his head and went in. Every time we, <clears throat> he saw me after that, he would ask me if he, we, if I had learned to feed the birds yet. I said I didn't know how he wanted me to feed them, and he said, "How would you give food to me?" He looked like he was going to bust out laughing any instant, and I nodded away and went away to look for Rick. When I found him, I said, "How would you give food to your grandfather?" Rick was used to questions like that, and <clears throat> he did not look at me as if I was crazy as someone else would have. We could not afford the luxury of being afraid to sound foolish. We burned for answers, and we asked whatever questions came to mind without reservation. Neither of us either, <clears throat> neither of us laughed at the other for asking. I'd hand it to him, he said finally. I was afraid he was going to say that. He wants us to hand the food to the birds, as if they're our friends. Rick said that maybe if we put some seed in our hands and sat very still, the birds might come down and take it. I reminded him that these were not park birds, but wild ones. Rick said that if Stalking Wolf wanted us to do it, it was probably no more impossible than all the other things we thought we could never do or understand. <coughs> it seemed like a good way to start anyway. We lay on the lawn and the seed in the palm of our hands and stayed as nearly motionless as we could all afternoon. A few birds came as close to the ground while we were there, but none ever came within arm's reach. Toward dark, we gave up and came in. I shrugged that stalking wolf and said, I guess we weren't still enough. Stalking wolf shook his head as if we were very foolish. When should you feed your friends? He said. It took me a minute to realize what he meant. But the next morning, long before dawn, Rick and I were lying in the dew-wet grass with our hands extended and our palms full of bird seed. We had perfected some measure of stillness from watching things in the woods, but this required not moving for hours, and it would have been very harder if we hadn't been as intense on it as we were. The thought of feeding the birds like our brothers was a vision worth believing in. It made everything possible. In the middle of false dawn, the birds came awake and blasted the morning, warning all the, all over the woods. And in a while, a house sparrow swooped down and took a flying peck. Perhaps an hour of swooping passes later, one landed and pecked some seed from my hand. I could feel the tiny pinprick of his spurs digging into my finger. Then he cocked his head sideways up my arm and looked directly into my eye. He blinked shook a little bit and took off again as if he was pretending that he hadn't seen me until he got out of reach <laughs> they had been eating out of Rick's hand for 10 minutes he was always more still than I was but I could usually stay still longer some creatures approach according to how still you are all others approach on the basis of how long you've been still we learn to stalk what we tracked we learned to survive in the woods problem by problem until we could go alone in the woods with nothing but a knife and s and still survive. More important, we learned a world view in which nature is a being larger than the sum of all creatures, and that can be seen best in the flow of its interactions. In the mov movement of each animal, all animals move. I am not sure if these were Stalking Wolf's own ideas or the ideas of his tribe, but Rick and I took them as articles of faith to live by, and we devoted our lives to living in the woods as much as we could and learning everything that was there. We sp spent most of the next nine years doing exactly that. We lived on a mixture of what Stalking Wolf had told us and personal conjecture, which we believed to be the true Indian way of life. 
We worked towards this ideal in everything we did. Indian braves were always fit. We rowed a heavy boat against the tide in the Toms River and cut wood every day. Indian braves were trained as warriors. We took kung fu with a neighbor and practiced our kicks continually in front of the cabin we built in the pines. The life we led kept us fit. Walking, running, crawling all day, or sitting motionless in a tree for hours at a time waiting to see something miraculous toned us better than any planned system of exercise could have. And we tracked constantly once Stalking Wolf showed us how to learn the secrets. Before that, we watched. And I will continue on part four. Thanks for listening.